Scott left the Senate, it became to me, it clear to me that he was the only person in that place that had any understanding of technology or digital rights and the only person who would stand up for an open internet, our right to privacy and freedom of information, speech and press above all else. The Liberal Party are trying to push through legislation for website blocking and mass surveillance via biometric analysis, including facial recognition, as well as the anti-encryption legislation. The attacks are continual, brutal, in most cases irreversible, and go through without proper scrutiny and with no opposition from the so-called opposition. Hmm. We are always on the back foot. We are always trying to fend off these attacks. We need someone to be proactively advocating for digital rights and for human rights. This is why I want to represent you in the Senate, but in reality, we need more than one lone voice in the Senate to, to do anything about this. The Greens want a digital rights commissioner working out of the Australian Human Rights Commission to serve as both an advocate um, in response to existing law and to work proactively as new law is proposed. The commissioner will ensure that human rights held by people offline or also, also protected online in accordance with the, the unanimous 2013 UN General Assembly resolution. In addition to the Digital Rights Commissioner, the Greens will repeal the mandatory data retention scheme under which Australian ISPs are required to retain two years worth of private location and personal contact information on every one of their users, which a wide array of government agencies can access at any time without judicial oversight, and in some cases without any oversight. Um, finally, we will update our outdated 30-year-old privacy laws, which are insufficient to protect our right to privacy. <coughs> Under the Australian Privacy <coughs> Act and the government's agenda of surveillance, young Australians might never be able to exercise their right to privacy and live their lives free from surveillance, interference of their communications, um, and where they are not merely reduced to marketable and malleable data points. We will update our privacy laws to be in line with the EU General Data Protection Regulation, um, which is consent-based and gives individuals the rights of access, erasure and transfer of their personal data. The EU GDPR is a, in stark contrast to our government's approach of not only not protecting, but actually leveraging the data collected by corporations so that they can have a look at it as well. I'm going to stop talking now because I know you came here tonight to listen to Scott, as did I. Um, I just wanted to finish by saying that I actually didn't join the Greens for their tech and their games policies. Um, I joined because I was driven by the climate emergency and the need to stand up for those who are being illegally detained in offshore detention camps. The fact that the Greens are the only ones with a plan for the future, the internet and the video games industry are really just icing on the cake. But it's very delicious icing. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much for coming tonight. Um, I'll hand you back to Emma. Thanks a lot. Played Blight. It was one of the games that Penny mentioned earlier. Um, but look, I play this game with my 11 year old, and we like to team up and do multiplayer to defeat the zombies together. And it's one of the things I love about the game is that instead of playing against each other, we're actually teaming up because I like to play dwarves and elves, and he likes to play as humans, but together, if we join our forces, we can defeat the zombies, which is kind of like being part of the Greens. <laughs> if we all work together, there is a place for all of us. And with that, I would like to introduce you to an unemployed resident of the south coast of New South Wales. <laughs> that has a certain ring to it, doesn't it? <laughs> Nobody else wanted to use the couch, but I thought we'd use the couch. Hello, thank you for coming. I was <clears throat> a little bit um, in doubt that we would be able to fill up this big room and make it feel warm. And I can just say right now, this is the very last time I will ever doubt the ACT Greens <laughs> <laughs> in anything at all. It's awesome to see so many people. Yeah, thank you all for coming. Um, all right, let me get my, let me get 
my head straight. This is also the first greeny gear I've done in well over a year, so apologies, I am probably super rusty. <clears throat> but um, what a nice homecoming and uh, <clears throat> a lovely reason to come back into things. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge um, that we're meeting on the traditional grounds of the Ngunnawal and the Ngambri people um, tonight and that sovereignty over this country was never ceded, which leaves a big question mark over the operation of that house on the hill which assumes actually that sovereignty resides in the Crown. And under British law, under any straightforward interpretation of British law, it doesn't. This place was occupied, uh, cultivated, and tended and loved for tens of thousands of years. Um, and I think it's important that we acknowledge that at every opportunity. Um, I have been away for <clears throat> um, nearly a year. I've spent uh, most of the last year on the road, um, which is why I've been a little bit quiet, but um, doing research for a book, traveling and, uh, and researching a book, partly on social movements and politics and on the how as well as the what. The, I, I feel like um, as, a, as a party, as a political party, but also as a, as a kind of a collection and alliance of social movements, we've got <clears throat> a pretty solid take on the what, on the where we need to go to. Penny has sketched out some of that tonight. <clears throat> Jordan, as soon as the Senate releases him, is gonna sketch out a little bit more. We have, uh, I think, a very, very solid policy base that has been uh, developed over the course of more than 20 years collectively. It's the largest experiment in, in deliberative democracy that I'm aware of in this country, where, poli where, where policy uh, and our initiatives and our plans and our intentions and the soul of the party is developed by the membership. Uh, no other political party tries to operate like that. It has its drawbacks, it's not perfect, it can be quite slow moving, but we managed to kind of grab the diversity uh, of, of backgrounds, uh, of intellects and of opinion, and <coughs> have pushed that together into a remarkable policy platform, which um, what Penny was reading from before, talking, for example, about the gaming initiative, pops out in these uh, crisp little two-page documents called policy initiatives and there's a bunch of those up the back on the table <clears throat> and the reason I'm taking a second to point these out is that maybe you will see a fragment of this online if you're lucky maybe you will uh, maybe it will make it into a newspaper ad or a Facebook square or something you might catch a glimpse of this some of this stuff during the course of the churn of an election campaign but actually there's a ton of really deep thinking and a lot of cases um, costed policy which we know we won't be able to get through the fog of an election campaign, but just so that you can kind of be confident and actually so that, so that we're confident that the work is getting done. Uh, the, the dollar amounts that Penny was putting on the table before are there for a reason that stuff has been costed and we also have done equivalent costings for how we propose to pay for this kind of stuff. So I know that it's not glamorous, but what it also means is that we, when we get Penny elected, <laughs> how, how does that sound? <laughs> I'm so up for this. Um, she and the rest of the team, like the, the actual hard policy thinking work has been done. Doesn't mean we're not responsive to emergencies and to stuff that kind of hits us a bit unexpected, but you're sending Penny and, her, and colleagues into that place with a bunch of ideas that have kind of been road tested. It's not to mean that these can't change, so get in touch if you read them and, and have other ideas. But what I've been researching, I guess, is um, with, this, with so much of that work being done, is a bit more about the how, is about how is it collectively that we didn't already win? Like, these are the best ideas. We've had all these great ideas, not just here in Australia, but right around the world. Communities, social movements, grassroots organizations um, have come up with plans for creating the kind of world where it is safe to bring up a child no matter where you happen to be, where we're not um, at serious risk of tipping the climate completely out of balance and creating uh, an immeasurably hostile uh, place for young people coming through to have to contend with. Well, how come we didn't already win? What is it that is actually preventing these ideas from uh, going beyond the prototype stage? The game industry one is such an, is such an interesting case study. And it, I mean, maybe it like, feels as though it's coming a little bit out of left field. This was something that popped out from when Simon Crean was Arts Minister in the Labor Party, to his credit, put this $20 million thing on the table. This is the Game Developers Fund that, that Penny referred to. <clears throat> and it lasted less 
than a year and then in the kind of great stomping on everything that was good that became known as the 2014-15 budget they just smashed it and uh, so it never really had a chance to prove itself up but that's one tiny little microcosm you know if you want to pick a bigger example we had a working carbon price in this country <laughs> that was plowing billions with a B of dollars into the clean energy and energy efficiency sectors it set up a billion dollar biodiversity fund um, it uh, protected people on lower incomes with um, with the tax uh, cuts so that people weren't actually going to be out of pocket even if particularly the people who could least afford it uh, and as we know that same government smashed that to pieces and only a few big pieces of that initiative remain and my question really is like we are out of time for that kind of behavior we don't have time to have our infrequent and valuable wins rolled back by these lunatics so one of the things that I guess are most interested in and why I figured I'd, I'd get out of Australia for a while is to learn from the experience of campaigners, activists, uh, and Green MPs and candidates, uh, big G and small g from around the world to kind of get a bit of a sense of how people are confronting these very same issues under very different and sometimes much riskier circumstances. And it's brought me back into this country with a probably a more profound appreciation of uh, how much more we have to lose here, like how uh, incredible this place is, but also like we have opportunities and resources and networks and a measure of political safety that some of our friends and colleagues in other parts of the world could can only dream of, where a meeting like this would come at high personal risk. Tonight, it's reasonably unlikely that um, police are gonna come through the door or that any of us are gonna get followed home. That's not by accident and that's not anything that we should ever take for granted. Shit, I've so, so greatly departed from the stuff I was gonna say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, however, <laughs> it's nice to be um, amongst friends and family back at a Greens gig um, because it reminds me again that we have in this in this particular place and moment we've got good people we've got ideas and we've got a very good chance of winning if this campaign gets the help that it deserves one of my greatest regrets and i've got a few from uh the great citizenship debacle of 2017 was that i only got to work with penny for um it seemed like a matter of minutes for how long <laughs> Seconds. was it like weeks uh, slash months yeah six or so weeks ridiculous so um, even in that very, very brief period of time, it is very obvious that you've got on your hands a perfect candidate for this electorate, for this generation, and for this moment. Um, I wish I'd got to work with you a little bit more closely. I really do. Uh, but what a comeback. Um, to, uh, because the thing about the ACT um, Senate spot is that it's a, it's a little bit of a dark horse, I think. Um, it tends to be assumed and, <coughs> and passed um, past elections have shown this, that it'll just go straight up um, Labour and Coalition. And so both of the major parties take it utterly for granted. It's unlike the regular states where there's, in a normal half Senate election, there, is, there are six seats up for grabs, they're fiercely contested, uh, and at different times, Greens have won um, a Senate seat in all of the states. But we've never managed to take one in the Territory before, and it's partly because the quota, the vote that you need to pull off, is, is more than 33%. So it's that much more difficult. It's only just a little bit easier uh, than knocking off a House of Representatives seat. So they tend to take it completely for granted, which is how you get somebody like Zed Seselja elected to the ACT Senate. This is the most progressive town, not just in the country, it's one of the most progressive and well-educated cities on the planet. And yet we have, we have one of Tony Abbott's acolytes, like hide openly, I don't think he even really tries to hide it. He's just really out there saying, oh, I wish Peter Dutton was Prime Minister. And the only way they can get away with that is by taking it for granted. If you look at the actual numbers, uh, and if you look at what large-scale experiments in field organising, a proper team and the right candidate for the moment can pull off in other electorates, Adam Bant has proved this, we've proved this uh, in a by-election in the Senate in Western Australia going back a couple of years. Uh, they proved it in Maywa in Queensland where Michael Berkman knocked off a lower house seat in a really, a really tough electoral ground in, in Queensland. It's winnable here, but the, the, the main thing is, and the, one of the reasons that we, that we kind of bring people together and place such an emphasis on field work, on individual one-on-one -on -one conversations with human beings either on the doors or on the phones or online, although in slightly different ways, 
is that that's how you change votes. If you don't have tens of millions of dollars of donations from BHP, the way that you win election campaigns in this country at this time is with big field campaigns and with candidates who are speaking from the heart about stuff that actually matters and cuts through the bullshit. Um, so if we invite you to go door knocking or to participate in a phone bank, apart from the fact that there's going to be more pizza and really good company, <laughs> we're not doing that stuff to make ourselves feel good. We're doing it because it works. If you spend an hour door knocking, you will probably turn one or two votes. And we know approximately the number of votes that we need to swing in the period of time that we have. And so we work backwards from that and say we need this many hundred or in the low number of thousands of door knocking hours and we can actually get this remarkable woman into the, into the Senate representing the ACT in the way that it so richly deserves to be represented. Penny, please. <laughs> and also, like, being a candidate is not an easy thing. Like, having, have they done, like, you've been face on posters and all this, oh, has yet. that started yet? <laughs> oh, all this to look forward to. Like, it's, it's kind of a confronting thing to stick yourself out the front of the bow wave and, and also be repping for this incredibly powerful and wonderful family. It's a big responsibility. Um, so thank you for doing that. It'll take a big chunk out of your life. And the, I guess the good thing about this party and this movement is that we're not just popping up overnight and we're not going anywhere, if not this time, next time, but actually maybe this time. So anything that you're able to do to lend a hand this is Josh up the back, who is studiously probably tapping out an email or something. Um, Josh is the campaign coordinator for Penny, uh, or for the whole ACT effort this time. And you're not allowed to leave unless you've spoken to him. <laughs> that wasn't a joke. <laughs> you have to talk to Josh. And he's probably going to just see your phone number or your email so that we can stay in touch and build the crowd. If you build the crowd, we can talk to the right number of people. That's annoying. <laughs> Lift motor out, please. <laughs> Nobody used the lift. Okay, so we talked a little bit about the game, the game stuff, and so that's this. Is somebody going to ring a bell when I run out of time? Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so that's this one: investing in the video game industry and Penny Canvas. That. Um, at length. One of the reasons that we did the inquiry and that it was such a joy to work on is partly that the industry here, although it's fairly small relative to other parts of the world. Um, has great advocates, like has the, the industry, both the developers who came and spoke to the Senate committee, but also the peak bodies and people like Tony Reid out of the arcade in Melbourne spoke up so well for the industry that we did manage to get the unanimous report. We got two Liberal senators to sign off on that report and say, A, the industry uh, needs a functional national broadband network, uh, and B, most approximately, I guess, for the industry, we need to restore that fund that we, that we smashed in 2014. It wasn't easy to get them to agree. They did that because the industry fronted such a coherent and compelling picture um, of the industry. So this it's absolutely winnable, and I think we will stand a better chance if we obliterate and run this appalling excuse of a government out on its ass next year, or this year if they want, that's fine too. Uh, <laughs> and you'd be dealing with a labor arts minister who might just at least have the amount of literacy to entertain the conversation. <coughs> and to the credit, they do have form. It was a Simon Crean thing that we're trying to resurrect, albeit we've said 100 million bucks because you're worth it. Um, <laughs> could we just have a brief moment of silence also before we move on for the National Broadband Network? <laughs> it's not funny either. Um, in, in the report and also in this initiative, there's, there's useful economic information about the number of jobs that exist, but also the potential about the industry structure, which Penny touched on, um, but also the scale of the industry. And that stuff is kind of a bit dazzling to politicians and probably helped us get the report over the line. For me, it's not the most interesting side. I know it's important, but for me, the cultural impact of the industry is what I find most intriguing because I... I honestly believe that it's only just finding its feet and we haven't seen the most interesting stuff by any means yet. Like this medium is so completely, it's not new because it has a lineage that goes back 20 or 30 years. I was playing Elite on my Commodore 64 long ago than I care to remember. So it's, this goes back a little way further than that. But I, William Gibson, the fiction writer, tells this really interesting story in one of his essays about memory that he has of, I guess it must have been in the 1950s, when the first television wood panel television arrives in his parents house in the US and he recalls how 
For the first few months, the only thing that you could receive on this, on this new device was a test pad, mm. in black and white. And people would sit around and watch the test pad. There would be this thing hanging in space. Nobody really understood what it was or how it was hanging there in this medium that you couldn't reach into and touch. But it was kind of mesmerizing for a little while until the regular programming started and everything turned to shit. But I <laughs> still was there. Um, there's something kind of to that where maybe a little past the test pattern stage of the industry, but I feel like there's kind of something to that. I don't think we have seen anything like the potential. Um, I bought a Vive a couple of years ago, two years ago, like a first generation one, a heavy thing, like two televisions strapped to your face, very close, <laughs> not super comfortable, with a big fat wire sticking out the back of it. Um, I mean, it's kind of awful, but also you know that this is something important. Uh, and where that medium is going to go and the potential of it, it's going to be used to do awful stuff, like television is, like any communications platform is, but I think it's also going to be used to create exquisite stuff, and it might even help us understand our world a little better, or perhaps a lot better. So we were really happy and remain very happy to support the industry. I don't think we want to be importing stuff from elsewhere. We have the talent, we have the capabilities here to do that. The other one, Jordan, I think is going to talk about accessibility, but the other one that I wanted to, to touch on is this one, which is the digital rights that Penny mentioned as well. Um, and this goes really deep. I think it's, it, it should be a no-brainer to say that digital rights are human rights, but they <coughs> have been treated as though they're, they're either in some kind of silo or, in fact, they really don't exist. You know, you've like seen your Facebook people saying, actually, privacy is for pedophiles. Like privacy, we, we think that's going to go away. We don't think that exists anymore. Um, and the wholesale negation of human rights just because they happen to be um, they happen to be in this new and developing medium. As so much of our financial lives, our social lives, and our political lives are being absorbed onto these platforms, um, that I think it's a tremendously important, and I think. As, as I guess Penny said, quite chronically underrepresented point of view in the Australian political domain that enough is enough and that we need to look for a different pathway to protect our rights individually and collectively <clears throat> online. Because the most powerful state and corporate actors in the world have wormholed and they've co-opted the medium in ways that we absolutely would not tolerate in the offline world. You know, if you permanently had a police officer assigned to just follow you around at a distance and record everybody that you spoke to, how long you spoke to them for, if anything was exchanged, where you were to within a few metres when you had that social interaction. And that person followed you into the bathroom and into bed uh, and into the boardroom. You, you, we, there is no way on earth we would tolerate that. The East Germans never managed to pull that shit off. That doesn't exist in North Korea at the moment. And yet we are expected to tolerate precisely that kind of behaviour uh, just because it's occurring on a mobile phone, just because that financial transaction uh, or that uh, social interaction is happening on an electronic device. It is assumed that our, our inner lives and our inner world are fair game. I came across this phrase, hmm, quick show of hands if you've heard it, data is the new oil. Is that like, I think I saw it in like The Economist or something like that, data is the new oil. And it was in capital letters, and might as well be like, great, data is the new oil. Um, and I, I, it took a second to realize why I found that phrase so repulsive, but I think it's an important one, is the corporate world sees data as the new oil, is that they want to extract it and refine it and batch it up and sell it at a profit. And that data is our most intimate lives. It's everybody that we communicate with and it's everywhere that we go. Um, not just our, our personal social networks and our interactions, but also our collective cultural heritage. And you look at the way that copyright law uh, is being co-opted for a kind of corporate enclosure of our collective human cultural inheritance and heritage. Um, it's data being treated as oil only in a different way. It's being closed, it's being privatized, and it's being sold off to the highest bidder. Um, and there are very bright people some of them involved in the foundation of the internet, still pretty vocal, but also a new generation of people coming through who have an abundance of ideas and tools and strategies and suggestions for doing things in a different way. But 
really doesn't need to be like, like that. Um, and so this initiative sets out some of the initial steps and I, we won't fool when, when we were developing this or the predecessor one that came before it that this would solve the problem, but it's the beginning of some self-protection measures and some proposals for how to do things really differently. Um, because of course, once these huge data pools exist, they are very readily exploitable by state actors who use it for legitimate law enforcement and intelligence gathering purposes, but also commercial espionage. We've seen how the misuse of surveillance powers directed against the government of Timor-Leste is one really proximate example of how you send an intelligence agency into wiretap a, you know, arguably a friendly government's cabinet rooms so as to pass that intelligence on to a gas company, uh, to kink commercial negotiations that are going on. Like, that is as far as you can go into the misuse of these civilians' powers. Or the fact that whistleblowers on Manus Island and Nauru talking to journalists at Fairfax or The Guardian, are, based, are, are they send the federal police out after those guys to try and get inside their telephones. And the only reason that this can occur in the Australian democratic system, uh, I've given up on the government, I think they need to be, I think we need to have have a good long look at them, some strategic thinking, and then I think we need to take a good solid kick and get them out of the building. <laughs> but the fact that they've been able to get away with the really savage abuses in the digital rights space and in many others is because they have a compliant Labor Party that is too shit scared because the political risk is too low. It's, it's politically less risky to just line up with Peter Dutton or Tony Abbott or George Brandis back when he was in there and just kind of, you know, avoid eye contact and then try and change the subject after they've done it. They are the reason we have data retention. If that crypto bill goes through, the Labor Party will be the reason that the crypto bill is able to go through because we have the numbers in the Senate to stop it. We will have an even better chance and need to rely on Pilecki crossbenches that one little bit less if we can get Penny elected next year as well. And so, at the risk of outstaying my welcome, um, it's our job to raise the political cost of just waving this stuff through. We can do that as a social movement. We don't need numbers in Parliament to do that. We can do that by banging on doors, by getting online, uh, and by getting in the faces of the MPs who think the political risk of just waving this authoritarian stuff through is low. Like every one of us, collectively and individually, can be a part of that, just in, in how we act online and who we talk to. We can raise the literacy of the digital literacy, both of ourselves through crypto party events, or by Asking your mates, have you opted out of the My Health Record thing yet? They might have thought this through and have legitimate reasons to want to stay in that. That's completely cool. But at least you have thought it through. Today was to be the last day. I'm not going to do a show of hands because it's probably a bit dodgy, but just have a thought. <laughs> like the clock is running out on that stuff. That's a really easy win. Just opt out of that shit if you can. Um, but also to win seats. Like numbers really matter. When we won, when Adam won the seat in Melbourne for the very first time, the incoming Gillard government needed to negotiate with the Greens on, uh, on a power sharing agreement, basically, to get Adam's vote of confidence uh, and, and passing supply in the House of Representatives. That was with one MP in the House of Reps and balance of power in the Senate. And so I hate the idea of politics being a numbers game. I think it should be a contest of ideas. I think it should be much more consensus-based push and pull. But elections and balance of numbers in the Senate is a numbers thing. Um, getting Penny in the Senate means that's one other useless crossbencher. Sorry, I love the crossbench. <laughs> Actually, it's 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 a Labor spot that no, it's Zed. Yeah. Get rid of him. Yeah. A moment of silence for Zed. <laughs> Just thinking about cancelling out that guy's political career in a really awful way. Like, how much would he hate being knocked off by a grave? <laughs> And a woman with short hair. Holy shit! <laughs> that's on us. Like, it's the folk in this room who will do that. Like, there's, as you say, there's nobody else. That's not true. Like, we have friends and allies all over this town. But uh, if you're here, it means you are now only one degree of separation away from you, and we're going to be very reluctant to let you go. Um, we're definitely going to need your help. Um, and I think also this is probably a really good time to mention this gentleman. Do you want just to stand up very briefly? So Tim doesn't. Have a, this is, as everybody knows, this is, this is Tim Hollow, who's incredible. Uh, I met Tim when he was Christine Mellon's media advisor going back a couple of years, so he's done the hard yards in Parley House, but he's also your candidate for Canberra. 
uh, which is also winnable because Andrew Lee's electorates move north. There's a whole bunch of probably staunch Andrew Lee voters who might be actually very, very interested in voting Green this time and put somebody into the House of Representatives. So this seat, um, Penny in the Senate, Tim in the House, is going to have a national focus once the media start really cotton on as to what's going on here and how the numbers are lining up. This place is going to have a national focus a bit unlike what we're used to. Um, I'm from WA. We're, we, we're used to election campaigns being all about the House and being all about Sydney and the Sydney-Melbourne axis. I actually think next year's campaigns can be really different. Uh, and the folk in this room are the ones who can really make a national splash by sending these gorgeous folk into Parliament. Okay, so I think that is um, probably all I was sent here to say. If I've forgotten anything, you'll be able to remember. Um, it's really wonderful to see you all here, and I look forward to seeing you at the next event, and I look forward to being part of the team that gets this wonderful woman into the House of Parliament, where she belongs. Thank you. smarter than me once said that hope is like the sun. If you only believe in it when you can see it, you'll never make it through the night. And I know that some of the stuff that Scott was just talking about does sound pretty scary about what can happen if we don't work hard to protect our rights and if we don't work hard to ensure that um, we look after our digital rights. But he also was talking to you about some of the things that we can do to take action to protect that. Um, so he mentioned that up the back there, where Jen is sitting, um, you'll be able to sign up to volunteer, you can make donations, you can pick up policy information that you can share with your friends and your neighbours. Um, one of the great things that I've learned about being in the Greens is that we are a group that is full of leaders. We all have the opportunity to lead in our own local area with our friends, with our neighbours, with our work colleagues to let them know, hey, here's what's going on, here's what you can do about it, and here's, you know, here's where you can go to find out more information. So if each of you were to go home and do that with the people that you know, it would make a huge difference in making sure that they know that they can vote for Penny, they can vote for Tim, and that they know what the Greens are going to do to protect our digital rights and to further support our video games industry. So please do look at going to sign up for that. Um, so we're just waiting a few moments uh, for our next speaker to arrive, but while we're waiting, now would actually be a really good time <laughs> to go and put your name down on the list um, and stretch your legs and then, you know, take your comfy seat again uh, ready for our next speaker, if that's, if that's something that you can do. Thank you. You know, you hear Conservatives go on as though people who struggle to access the internet are complaining about the fact that they can't download Netflix or YouTube. And, and it makes me die slightly inside because they're usually all over the age of 60 um, and don't look like they could complete Pong if you gave them a hand. Um, but also because that kind of small, um, gnarlish, ignorant thinking completely erases the vital role that communications technology can play and does play in everyday life in nearly everything we do. Now the Greens have always recognised this and we have been absolutely resolute in our defence of the NBN, in our advocacy for the closing, uh, for the erasure of digital inequalities and for the expansion of the accessibility and inclusivity of the internet and communication services. And that's particularly a lens that I've brought to the role. Tonight, uh, I am absolutely thrilled to be able to share with you all our federal policy announcement in relation to the National Broadband Network for the upcoming federal election. And absolutely central, the bedrock of our commitment this time round is a cast iron vow that the MBN shall always remain in public hands. 
There can be no privatization. It must be retained as the universal, accessible, affordable wholesaler of internet services in Australia. And we will fight any and every attempt to privatise it. The disastrous decision to sell off Telstra must not be repeated. I'm glad we're on the same page. Then. <laughs> Otherwise, this would go very badly. For me. <laughs> Beyond that commitment, we need to fix this thing. We need to look at it honestly. We need to assess the issues that have been created. And we need to complete this absolutely vital infrastructure project with only one goal in mind, what is the best technology to deliver on the needs of, us, of the Australian people who own it and who rely on it. That means fibre to the premises. <laughs> it means fibre to the curb and it means 5G. But there is no place for a mixed technology mongrel that is what the current government has put on the table. It has and will cost us billions of dollars. But we must stop this absolutely disastrous waste of money and time on technologies that are obsolete by the time <coughs> they are delivered. And we must free the corporation from the interest from the requirement to uh, re-interest its loans so that it can invest in itself. We need it to get back to the business of performing a public good instead of seeking to make profit at the expense of consumers. And once we have done these things, we must then return as a government as operators in the parliamentary space to realising the full possibilities of the MBN. And that means making sure that it breaks down social barriers. So we will also commit at this election to spending an upwards of $2 billion over the forward estimates on programs that will facilitate the access of the internet uh, by people in vulnerable social situations through the social services system. The internet should not be, access to it should never be, the sole preserve of those who are able to afford it. If it does, if it plays that role, it will continue to exacerbate social disparities. And we must ensure that it is able to play the role of breaking the tyranny of Australia's geography and bringing people together with the services that it needs. So we will also commit to expanding programs like the Black Spot program, like the uh, similar uh, monitoring services run by the ACCC to include uh, Skymuster satellite programs so that rural and regional communities are not left behind in this transition. And finally, we will ensure that as we build the NBN, as we roll it out, and as we continue a broader conversation about the opportunities that are created by embracing digital technologies, we never leave disabled people behind. And that is why... <laughs> that is why I'm incredibly proud, proud to announce that we will fully commit to funding a national, uh, a national communication service to deal, uh, to facilitate the uh, regulation and creation of accessible technologies uh, for the information space, that we will fully commit to the funding of the uh, national 
the, uh, the National uh, Relay Service um, and that we will fully commit to the adequate funding of interpretation services uh, where they are related to the access of communication technologies. We will do all of these things because they are what is needed in order to create not only an NBN that works for people, not only a society that brings people together, that gives people opportunities, we will do them because they are nothing less than you should be able to expect. As a public who have put your faith in government to deliver a massive infrastructure project. We will take no prisoners. We will shy away from no challenge in ensuring that we deliver what people need. A service that is able to facilitate the transformation of Australia and create a future for all of us. Thanks so much for your time. <laughs> because I'm pretty sure that some of these people here today would Absolutely. like to ask you a few questions. And uh, Scott, our friendly unemployed South Coast resident, would <laughs> <laughs> like to <laughs> come back to <laughs> And oh. Penny? <laughs> so, look, I, I do hope that you've been thinking about questions that you'd like to ask. Um, is there anyone who's already got a question? Just raise your hand. Yes. Okay. Right here in the middle. <laughs> um, this is, I guess, just for everyone on the panel. Um, I think but last week it was we saw sort of a whole lot of stuff with relation to the video game Red Dead Redemption 2 and people posting essentially like violent things on on YouTube where in the game people would say throw a suffragette to an alligator or something like that. Quite hateful stuff. Um, and I wonder what, how do you deal with that? Is that just a consequence of giving uh, a toxic, toxic masculinity culture a, a sandbox to play with? Or do games developers have some kind of responsibility in ensuring that this sort of thing doesn't That's an excellent bloody question. <laughs> um, what was your name again, my friend? Uh, Ian. Ian, you stumped us, I think. <laughs> I can see a bit... I, I, well, sorry. No, I you can I, look, I can see a little bit of both sides of, uh, of your argument, to be honest. I mean, if you do give folks a, a sandbox, the sandbox will reflect what's playing around in the sound. Um, and it's, it, it, it's a... You know, we see there the broader problems that we have in society. Um, but I can also see a little bit of, uh, of, your, of the counter view to that. Um, do, do you have a view yourself? No, I, I'm, I'm also I'm a bit stumped. I mean, yeah. I suppose in some respects we see people taking efforts to stop uh, platforms like Facebook and Twitter mm. from allowing hate speech and things like that to um, propagate, I suppose. Uh, but then again, the game in itself is a, just a, 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 you know, a constructed device that people use. So, mm. yeah, I, I'm not really sure. I, but I, I thought that um, better minds than mine. Perhaps <laughs> the game's developers. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't think it's the game developers' fault, <laughs> no. Um, I mean, I think that it's video games are a medium and they allow people to create whatever kind of content they want when they have those tools available to, to the end user. Um, and I think you could say the same things about, you know, giving people an iPhone that has a camera and what they're going to do with that, or, um, you know, people picking up a pen and paper and what they're going to draw and how they're going to create things in those mediums. Um, you know, the question of, of violence and behaviour comes back to video games repeatedly, but the truth is it's, it's occurred 
in every medium before video games. Uh, you know, people are always outraged about violence on TV and, you know, it just, it really goes back to radio and um, every medium before that. So, I mean, I think, I think that the platforms where those, um, those stories and those uh, things are being displayed have a, have some um, responsibility in terms of what they're allowing to be put on the platform. Um, and uh, ideally, the developers could have a role in encouraging positive behaviour, but I, mean, I think it's really hard to, to control human behaviour and the way that they um, uh, display themselves. But also, I think it is true of uh, what Jordan said in terms of it's reflecting broader things that are happening in our, our culture at the moment. Does that go to, do you think, um, you know, some of what, what you were talking about earlier about digital rights and, you know, the right to create and who's actually the gatekeeper on that? Like, who gets to decide what we can do and what we can't do online and, you know, keep track of it? Okay. Feels for me a bit... I, I love the question because although it's not an edge case, like this happens every time a Grand Theft Auto comes out or, like, this question kind of feels a little bit perennial in a way but it's a really interesting way to just test community values that you throw that one out there and I think that's that's gross but I'm probably not going to go home and work on it like I'm not um, I'm not sure that it's more than something that's just going to roll around and quite quickly be plowed under and, and be forgotten but then also a couple of weeks ago a friend of mine let me know that um, some Brazilian developers had made a game where you got to play uh, with Jair Bolsonaro, who's an out-and-out -out fascist who got, just got elected as the president of Brazil, and your job is to round up journalists and murder political opponents, and there's basically a little fascism trainer, and I think that shit should be kicked off steam. Like, I really do. Um, but others in the room might draw that line in a different spot. And, like, at the moment, there's this really interesting kind of sleeping giants thing whereby you see offensive stuff come up on Sky News, and they are basically crowdfunding anti-advertiser stuff to get advertisers to pull their support from the platform. But that relies on the outrage being collective and widespread enough to have an impact. So if you're a question like the one you're raising is, well, I don't know whether it's legit to do a show of hands or not, but who thinks that kind of stuff should be pulled? I'm not sure it should, even though it makes me feel a bit ill, but I would totally respect the view of somebody who did. Pulled, shut down. Like, you write an email to Google and they rip it off YouTube. Like, what do people think? Can I say something on this? Yeah, your question is, yeah, you should ask them for a show of hands. <laughs> what, what uh, unless that? people think that's a little bit dodgy. Who thinks that YouTube should have an obligation to rip down that kind of shitty content if it's like clearly an, an abusive instance of some in-game play? Okay, so it's like, a, I would call that a sizable <laughs> minority. That's not like, a, it's not a trivial minority. A bunch of people folk didn't put I think we were, sorry, we pre-prepared this, we were discussing this in the car on the way over. So like, <laughs> slightly rehearsed, but like, I feel like a, a, a game, and I have, I don't know anything about games, so, hi, <laughs> but I feel like games, if we, if we look at them, like we look at other bits of art, you know, like films or books or whatever, it's just the culture that we have discussing itself, yeah? So what if like the culture that we have is just full of toxic, like really toxic masculinity where people like get off on this shit and are like, hey, let's put hundreds of hours on like people's actual lives and creativity into creating this like beautiful game. But instead of it being like a fun thing, it's a thing where like people get off on being violent. So like, I feel like maybe instead of hitting things as ScoMo would want, hitting it with a, like a big legislative stick, we should maybe like focus on bringing people along with that conversation of like, hey, this is like a beautiful piece of art and I appreciate your skill, but like, can we maybe next time not be toxic shitheads? I don't know, I just, <laughs> just putting that out there. <laughs> Let's not be toxic shitheads. That's, I might just read that into the hand sir. <laughs> Google's new, um, if you're watching at home. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like there's pretty strong support for that proposition. <laughs> Do we have another question? Yes, at the back there. Uh, yeah, I think your policies are fantastic. You're the only party that makes sense at the moment. Um, fixing the NBN, Dylan obviously the video games place. Mm. Um, the question is basically, what do you need to do to win? And not beyond we getting any win. Have you analysed the, the space? 
many lots in the ward, what's required, what efforts is required nationally, not just <coughs> right now, but to get you over the line so we can actually enact what you're trying to do. While we're still live streaming this. <laughs> <laughs> No secret. <laughs> well, I, I mean, you know the ACT context better than I do. But. Well, I mean, I think you're talking nationally, though, aren't you, in terms well, of being able to you, form a minority <laughs> government or a majority government, perhaps, sometimes <laughs> in the future? I mean, I, I, suppose, I suppose we need to first start by asking ourselves the question of what do we mean to win, right? So, I mean, if we're talking about what do we need to, to have a majority in both the House and the Senate, um, I, I think that we've got a bit of a way to go, right? <laughs> um, you know, maybe not this election, but next one. <laughs> um, but I, I think that, um, to put it really bluntly, uh, because people are really angry uh, with the uh, nonsense that has been politics for the last decade, uh, every single election cycle, you've gone to the ballot box and said, Enough. Somebody else. You're not doing it well enough. And so we've seen a, we've seen a systemic uh, structural decline in support for both of the parties, right? Um, to the point where I think you know, it's, it's the lowest point ever and we have a cross range of, of 18 or more. Um, now, what that has effectively done, in my opinion, is to redefine what it means to win an election. You may well form a government in the lower house. It may well be born <coughs> down there or over there, um, but it lives or dies in the Senate. It lives or dies in its ability to, to control a, an ever-growing crossbench in the House itself. Um, so I think Australians quite radically are uh, redefining what our government looks like by breaking apart the, the two-party monopoly that has existed um, for so long, which brings you, you know us to the, to the answer that you know, that kind of ability for us to have policy enacted and things like that, uh, you know, comes ever closer each election. But in a broader sense, I think we have to remember that in order to do things like fix the MBN or any of the other transformative politics, uh, policies that we are putting forward as a movement at this election or any other, it is about creating a movement of people both in the parliament and outside of it. It can't, you know, we will never succeed in achieving the transformative changes that our society needs if me and Penny rock up to you on election day and go, rightio folks, vote for us, and then once you voted for us, thanks very much, we'll see you in four years time. Like, and that can't be the way that it works anymore. We will only succeed if we are a true movement, both in and outside of the parliament, and that means campaigning, yes, at elections, but also outside of the cycle as well. Um, at the same time as the electorate works together to greater uh, break apart that monopoly, therefore allowing uh, movements like ours to, to make the voice of people more prominently heard. Um, so I don't know whether that goes enough of a way to, to answering your question. I mean, yeah, I, I mean, um, I mean, Scott, you've, you've had the experience now of being both in and outside this space. So have you. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Although I haven't gone back out of it yet. <laughs> um, although, um, so, I mean, uh, do you have a particular take on that one? I don't know whether the question was meant more tactically. Um, so where, where my head, I mean, I think what you've both said is spot on. Where my head went a little bit was, is again, more to the how. And um, these two are both right. Like, we're not going to win a majority in the House of Representatives next May or whenever this thing rolls around. It might be sooner. So what we tend to do each election is say, if we were to try and do that and we spread our efforts smoothly across 150 seats and Senate slates right across the country, you end up winning nowhere. Um, it's about focusing, concentrating effort on where we can win, and those are judgment calls. Uh, some of it's research, some of it's gut instinct, a bit of science, a bit of art. And so I wasn't fooling around before when I said this city, this territory is going to be under the spotlight next year, unlike Absolutely. it ever has before. Not because we say this at all our public meetings, but you look at the electoral map 
and some shifts can happen here that will catch the majors by surprise. Mm. Um, so how we get our agenda up is stepwise. You go from being out of parliament to having a single Joe Valentine or a single Bob Brown who just used the platform, they didn't have balance of power, but they used the platform and the soapbox that you get, to moving into a space where you have um, a team that can hold balance of power, which effectively means you are the swing vote in the rare occasions where the two majors disagree. And then a much larger crossbench, uh, and we are the largest piece of that crossbench, or for example, the power sharing arrangement, which was not a coalition, we had Adam in the House, we had a team of 10 of us in the Senate, and we won uh, basically due to the, 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 a ton of goodwill that was built by Christine Milne and that team at the time, to have a world leading carbon price initiative, like the largest macroeconomic reform that we had seen probably since the GST was introduced. Um, so I don't know if that's what you mean by winning, felt like a win on the day. And then you go from that to having a formal coalition. Have a look at how our team is working in New Zealand at the moment, mm. Kiwi Greens. We have ministers, we have more than three. How yeah, oh, uh, a, lot more. a lot more than three. Well, they have, they have multiple portfolios and they are kicking goals over there. Or you look at what Shane has managed to knock off in his town. 100% renewable energy city, electrified light rail public transport coming down North Port Am. They will plant the trees again. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Thank you. I'm a bit out of these loops. Uh, Stepwise, until you end up with a Green Prime Minister, you don't get it done all at the time, but if you've earned that trust and you haven't betrayed it in any way along the line, you end up in a power sharing arrangement or you end up in government. Uh, and our job, I guess, is to bring that sense of urgency. We mm. cannot afford to screw around on 10% of the vote any longer with them. Absolutely. Um, but that's going to need collective effort. Do we have another question? Yes. Yeah, so on the subject of digital privacy, um, I think one of the problems is how invisible it is. Um, like a lot of people don't really understand what possibly is the data that's collected. Um, I guess the most that you have is seeing as a passive user. It's like, oh, how do you go around that? So how can we make it more visible to people? I mean, Look, I, I think, sorry, what was your name? Harriet. Harriet, thank you for that question, Harriet. It's something that I've been reflecting on in the last year, because you really do see, over and over again, um, this, this really toxic, corrosive creep uh, that is the erosion of our digital rights and privacy. And these huge pieces of stuff either bear down on the parliament um, or go through the bloody thing, uh, and, and you know, at least on the inside, you think it should catch a lot more headlines than it does. Um, there's a lot of reasons for that. You, you know, you are, you are right. And one of the reasons is that um, the extent of information that we, that we ourselves share um, is in many ways, if not completely hidden from us, but actively obscured. Um, and the extent to which that information is then shared with others, and we saw that with the Cambridge Analytica stuff. Um, so yes, there is a challenge, but there is also a profound opportunity, because we have a, a broader problem in Australia, which is the opaque non-existence of our formalised human rights in the form of a, of a Bill of Rights. Um, and that conversation has remained pretty moribund for you know, the last 50 years. Um, but one of the great ways to reinvigorate that, that conversation, in my mind, is via the route of, of digital rights. Uh, because uh, people don't understand, for, it, for instance, I, I've found that there isn't a massive amount of understanding that we uh, don't. For instance, it, there was a poll out that Gillian Triggs quoted it. That was 64% of people believe that we don't have a right to religious freedom in Australia, uh, but we do have a right to freedom of speech. Mm. When in fact, the exact opposite is true in the law. Um, so there isn't a great public understanding of, of what human rights legislation does and doesn't exist on the books. There is an understanding that we have a problem, I think, with digital private privacy as a whole, if not those specific issues, because everybody, um, is a little bit terrified of what would happen if their digital devices were broken open. Mm. 
But then there is a great opportunity to reinvigorate those conversations there. Internationally, though, there are some really bloody great examples of ways that we could be moving to enshrine people's digital rights and make them clear to folks, um, you know, in the EU particularly. Um, it actually, at the end of the day, though, uh, partly depends on the desire of government to give information to people about what their rights are, what information these big corporations do or don't have. And there is not that desire to provide that information by our government at the moment. In fact, the exact opposite is the case. They're very happy to keep that kind of obscure so that they and their security agencies can gather it when they need to or feel like it. Um, so that is a cultural challenge in our parliament as well, I think. Yeah, I mean, uh, just to add to what Jordan said, particularly at the end there, I think a big problem is that we don't have a government that's working um, in the public interest. They're not on our side. They're not trying to bring these issues to mm. light. They're not trying to bring corporations into line. They're just trying to leverage what's already happening as much as they can for their own benefit. Um, mm. uh, you know, in the EU, you know, the governments are actually working in the public interest and that's why they're bringing forth this legislation. But mm. I think when you have issues that are so, you know, technical and complicated and also it's a question of um, do I do this thing that might be dif difficult or difficult to understand versus what's easy and what's enjoyable and, you know, what I do every day. It's mm. kind of, it's hard for people to grasp that and to, to get involved, I think. But, you know, one... One thing that has come up recently, which has brought it to light um, at a very personal level, I think, has been the My Health record. Mm -hmm. um, and people have really grabbed onto that and, and they understand what the medical data means and they understand what it means for people who they don't trust and they don't know to be accessing and, that to re and reading that and what that could mean for them in a way that they don't really get with all of you know, the, mm. the, the Facebook issues or you know, the, the communications tapping. Mm. Um, it's a lot more real and it's a lot more personal. So mm. I think we latch on to those opportunities and we use them um, to communicate with people and to educate them and to, um, to rile them up about why they need to care about their digital rights. That's a really beautiful example. Mm. Also, of, like that's a bottom up grassroots. No, no organization is orchestrating that campaign that's come out of that general Disaffection and fed upness, I think, with the abuse of the stuff. So people I'm, going, no, I'm just opting out. It's going to opt out. I'm going to tell other people, I'm going to check in. The, the only people who's disagreed with me about opting out so far was my GP, who was really cross with me for some reason. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> it's like pretty much right across the board. Um, the other thing that occurred to me, I guess, and I know it's easier to say than to do, but we see it happen every now and again, is like we're dealing with a communications medium most powerful communications medium that our species has managed to come up with and we use the platform to defend itself. Um, there was an example going back a couple of years where Labor government under Stephen Conroy's comms minister tried to introduce mandatory internet filtering and they kind of sleezed it around and future governments eventually got some of what they wanted. But at the time when that thing again it was very raggedy and it was very bottom up, the government couldn't stick one of these stupid videos on Facebook or talk about any other policy area without a thousand nerds showing up and bombarding their comments and their feeds and their Twitters and their this and that with stuff about this particular issue. It's like you want to use the medium, don't abuse it. You know, it's yeah. a communications medium, it's also an organising platform, but it's also a site of intense political contest. And I feel like, you know, like the environment in forms of civil disobedience to protect the medium. A couple of years back, a handful of us publicly said we will not be filling out your, your census all the way through. We're still going to submit it, but you can't have these things that you have no right to have. And so forms of civil disobedience you, that use the platform to propagate the message can make it hard for them to put other messages out. We need the internet. Every political candidate and party in this country needs that medium to be friendly to them to be able to put the rest of their message out. And we can make it... Yeah, we can make it very unfriendly. I think there was another question over here. Hi. <coughs> yes. Because they said only 4% have opted out. And I, I work for the government, federal, and I know that this information is not secure. They say it is, but anyone can hack in if they're knowledgeable enough about hacking. I don't think that my health record is any safer than when I work. I'm not saying that is, but um, <laughs> our sold down two years ago, so I think if my health record is so like fascist, <laughs> that anyway, my, my employer is the government, so they can have I'm one of the 4% of opted out as soon as I heard Dad do. Because it was opt in, 
I think, well, sorry, what was Justine. Justine? I think Justine that the figure actually might now be higher than that. Uh, yeah, there, there have been, been figures, and I can't name the exact figure, but there have been figures into the millions um, so far. Um, but you, but to your central, to your central point, right? Oh. And, and look, we've, yeah, we, we've seen with, with this um, just like breathtaking uh, incompetence on behalf of the minister particularly and the government more generally. Um, we've been dealing with an amendment in the Senate today um, around young people from the ages of 14 to 16. Right, so the, the legislation is currently drafted would have meant that when you are, have your record created, uh, that record is then automatically accessible and shared with your parent or guardian. Mm. Now that uh, has profound implications mm. uh, for uh, folks who are trying to access mental health services, are trying to access re reproductive health services, trying to access sexual health services, right. anything, uh, and uh, trying to report abuse, absolutely. Mm. Um, and, uh, you know, this was not even on the government's radar. <laughs> now, thankfully, we've been able to put up an amendment uh, that would mean that uh, that is reversed, so that you have to actively give consent. Uh, but, and, it, and, and after a, a bit of work today, that amendment has the support of, of the ALP and of the crossbench. So hopefully tomorrow we will knock that thunder off. If I look a bit washed out today, that's, that's why. Um, it's, it's called Wednesday. Um, but but, you, but you're, at, you, you know, more broadly, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. We. Uh, it is scary um, uh, because it is not, it's not on its own. It doesn't occur in isolation. In the year that I've been here, uh, you know, I, I have seen a, a trend continue of this government uh, aided and bloody abetted by the Labour Party. Let's just be honest. They've never seen a piece of national security legislation or so-called national security legislation that they haven't voted for, you know. Um, it is a trend, it is a, it is a terrifying trend, particularly when you consider that the man at the top of it is Peter Dutton. Like, it, it, it sends a shiver down your spine. Um, I don't know if I, I need to add. <laughs> Uh, I, I would just add yes, like I think you're right, the, the design of the My Health Records system is fundament, fundamentally flawed in that it's all in a central repository accessed by you know, thousands or hundreds of thousands of people and each one of those humans are you know, inherently flawed um, and just you have, have to compromise one human, not even one computer or whatever uh, you know, security settings they, they claim to have set up. Um, and that's something that's that's very easy to do. Um, if you have one person in a hospital who has a vendetta, mm. then they can access the whole repository of information. The, the, the head of the, the head of the agency, uh, the head of the privacy section of the agency, has recently revealed to to have been to have resigned and moved on, uh, or fired or pushed because she didn't feel as though her concerns were properly being listened to. Uh, there's a, uh, a venture capitalist group, Tide Group, which have this week met to discover, uh, to discuss whether um, they have any future um, in, in their, uh, they have decided to create uh, Australia's first consumer-led health information application. Uh, and because one of the amendments that came out of the Senate inquiry was that uh, th there should be tightening of protections around sharing of data with third parties. Now, all of a sudden, a four million dollar enterprise uh, feels that it needs to call an emergency meeting to discuss whether it wants to wind itself up completely. Um, so, you know, there is some very uh, sinister uh, elements and, and discourses around uh, some of the motivations here. I think. Mm. Thank you. Um, can someone just give me a quick time check? How are we going for time?
I'm just nearly sure of it. Nearly quarter two. So we're, we're running a bit over time already. With three politicians on the panel, I don't never. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost like we like to talk, isn't it, really? So we've just got one last question, and I can see you, you're very keen to ask yeah. something. Um, I would really like to pursue the first question, but I'll leave that for the moment. Um, my other question is, with regard to um, actual data collection around cities and how much is currently legal and what what is in place to, to protect us at the moment. I just a week and a bit ago went to a conference in Sydney called Smart Cities. Mm. Um, it wasn't what I was expecting and I accidentally ended up in the wrong workshop <laughs> thinking I was going to learn about how digital technology could help socially disadvantaged people. I got into one that was a research hub where they were all talking very excitedly about how many other points were going to be needed to collect data on everybody. And I started, actually I felt really concerned um, and talking to people were saying, you know, I don't, you know, I feel very uncomfortable with this. And they said, oh, look, if you're not doing anything wrong, you shouldn't. <laughs> and, and <laughs> well, then give me your <laughs> internet password. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. The government doesn't like me. Yeah, um, yeah. It, it concerned me. I just don't know how much you know, protection we have at the moment or how much companies are able to just put up their data collection points currently. What, do you know what their position is? I, I think at the moment it's a complete free for all. Yeah. Look, to, yeah, look, to, look to Barcelona. It's one really interesting example of a city that's, that's just completely inverted the model, which is that kind of extractive data is the new oil model that's being rolled out across cities like at a really granular scale at the moment. They've inverted that and kind of started to apply that principle of data sovereignty, which is actually you own that, it's yours. <coughs> and the city will own the infrastructure. So they're not allowing Google's and Facebook to be mining our private information. And, and basically hiving this stuff off into proprietary databases. The city's going to own what collection infrastructure there is, and you own the material that's collected. And then every, it just in, it inverts that notion of consent. A lot of this is about consent or the absence of it. Um, so, I mean, maybe there's other good examples, but that's one that I've come across where they are deliberately doing it very differently. I think, I think we, have to, we have to be really clear uh, about the fact that uh, it is our data. You know, if it is information on us, we should have control over it. And legislation should reflect that. There are instances when data can be useful. For instance, uh, you know, the NDIS is an incredible opportunity to, to gather uh, uh, information on a group which has been comprehensively failed by um, statisticians, um, and, and bureaucracy around the gathering of information uh, over decades. Um, challenge is though, you go to the agency, can I see my own data? And their answer is, yeah, no, some of it maybe at some point go away. You know, and, and so that ownership of data as embodied by some of the legislation in the EU is, is really important. And then the second conversation is whether or you own it or not, how much should be out there? You know, how much do we want to collect on people? Um, and, I, and I think that is an interesting community conversation for us to have. Um, because I'm, I'm really not sure that there, there, are, there are pros and cons, but it is becoming increasingly impossible to disappear in any way, shape or form. Um, and to take back the agency inherent in that process. Um, and it does, it does concern me. So I think in terms of your, your rights, sort of under the Privacy Act, you've got a right to, to, know, what to, to know what data they're collecting on you, um, you know, not necessarily government agencies, but um, and you've got a right to correct, correct information that's incorrect, but you don't, you don't give consent for them to collect that information. You don't have a right for them to, to ask them to delete that information. Um, and if you're a political party or a politician, you can just do what you like. Um, and these are the sorts of things that we want to we want to fix. We want to make it consent based. Uh, we want to put that back in the hands of the individual. And if you look at the, the this identity matching matching this biometrics 
um, and mm. facial recognition stuff that is coming um, that the government has already introduced like you know they're they're it's laying the foundation for a lot more surveillance to come in the in the real world being translated into digital information so and the government is really even kind of bragging about um, how they're going to hook that up with CCTV and be able to just have constant video surveillance of everybody um, heading towards yeah. the system that I'm sure you've seen they've got in, in China. China. Yeah. Um, and I'm wondering, are they installing it in the ACT? What are those new cameras as you enter the ACT and exit the ACT? No sign, yeah. just what cameras. <laughs> I do not know the answer to that question. Uh, Look, I, if they were just there to track Baton movements at night, that would be okay. Yeah, yeah. Baton surveillance. Yeah. Did you know rights for that? Yeah. I, I mean, look, I, I, I had to chuckle a bit of dark laughter when we were discussing the, the biometric facial recognition because what was the name that, that they gave that? The capability. The capability. <laughs> it's, it's almost like they are they going, oh, let's just make 1984 so real. <laughs> yeah. In the meantime, you can lock down your phone's privacy settings so that it's not broadcasting your... Like, we don't have to make it easy for them. Like, raising the cost of surveillance is something that we can do. Yeah. Like just lock down, like our phones, if we consent to it, if we let them, are broadcasting all kinds of stuff that an increasing number of devices are picking up. So you can lock that down and at least be leaving less of a trail of breadcrumbs behind us. Get a VPN. Mm. And <laughs> get a VPN. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, very much. Jordan, is there something you well, 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 yes, Emma, there is. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, but, but quite seriously, folks, everything that we've talked about this evening, everything that, that Scott has, has brought to us, everything a penny spoken on, you know, the stuff about the MBN that I outlined, none of it happens unless we are able to come together as a movement of people and get incredible folks like Penny elected to the Senate um, and get incredible people like Tim uh, in there in the House. And because we are a movement which draws a bloody line in the sand and says, do you know what? You can do big organising while rejecting big money. That is our premise. That is, what, that is our central organising principle. And because of that, we need people. We need as many people as possible to get involved with this campaign to join the Greens movement as we work to bring these issues to the front. So there is a wonderful, smiley, ginger-haired gentleman <laughs> at the back there by the name of Josh. He's standing around some laptops. Um, please uh, get involved with this campaign. We have an opportunity to put the ACT front and centre in national politics as never before get big money out of our system and, in, and create that future for all of us that is possible. So thank you so much for coming along tonight and please don't leave without talking to Josh. <laughs>